All right, good afternoon. Um, let's get started. Uh, so if you can turn on your camera, that'd be great. All right, uh, I understand that this is probably dinner time for some of you and that you might have to work uh, right before this class. You probably don't have time to eat. Um, it's totally fine if you want to use this opportunity to eat while you're listening to the class. Uh, in that case, just make sure that you have a profile picture. Um, you know, just take a picture of yourself and upload it to um, Zoom and uh, set it up there. That'll be fine as well if you don't want to use um, live camera. All right, uh, let's see. So my name is Jiang Liu. I'm a PhD student at UNH. Uh, this is, I just finished my third year. I'm going to my fourth year in the program. Uh, I study applied mathematics and uh, specifically I work with um, a professor that research um, nutrient transport in the stream. So we look at how nutrients from one point going down the stream, like what does the process look like? How do you model the process mathematically? Um, so that's kind of my um, area of research. Let's see. Um, so I know that some of you are new to UNH, some of you um, probably being at UNH for one term or one year. Let's see. Um, if you can, I can see a few of you. Can you raise your hand if you're new to UNH? Okay, there's quite a few of you, excellent. All right, uh, let me ask you, how many of you have never taken a pre-calculus class before or maybe called introduction to calculus, some equivalent variation? Um, so Jack, so a couple of you have not taken pre-calculus before, that's totally fine. All right. Excellent, but uh, I'm sure you all came with Algebra 2 background. Um, excellent. So uh, for this class, this is a great calculus class, and we're going to finish it in eight weeks. Uh, we meet three days a week, except for this previous Monday, the holiday. And uh, we're going to have, if I remember correctly, we're going to have three exams. They are all mid I call them midterm exams. We really don't have a final exam. Uh, just going to be too much work towards the end of the summer for everyone. Uh, I'm sure you are starting your classes soon. Uh, and then we're going to have a few quizzes and uh, weekly homework. Uh, let's see. Let me share my syllabus with you. So hopefully you can all see the screen I'm sharing. Let me know if you cannot see it appropriately. Let's see. So this is the syllabus. So like I said, uh, this class is mostly pre-calculus. The textbook is available. If you look at the syllabus, oh, well, before I say that, I should mention that the, the class website is on this um, website, mycourses.unh.edu. So this is a student version. So if you log into that website, you should see something like this. You have a home page have the announcements and the assignments notification. Then you can click on the syllabus and uh, click on this um, link here to see the syllabus. You can download it or directly view it on the website. Um, announcements will be posted here. And I already put an announcement there last week. Uh, pages is where I usually keep the weekly schedule. If we have a quiz, for example, for tomorrow, we have a small quiz, which basically just for you to practice using a some sort of some app on the phone or maybe an actual scanner to scan five pages of documents or notebook. Or could be blank pages, doesn't have to have anything there. Uh, and I just want them to be in the same PDF file. I don't want to see five single pages in five different files. I want to see one PDF file with five pages. So it could be anything, just take out a book, scan five pages, or take out your notebook, scan five blank pages. So that should be relatively easy to do. Um, if you have any trouble, let me know. We can go through that together over um, office hours. Uh, and just make sure that you know you can upload it to Canvas. And uh, I believe that's, um, I forget how many points I gave for this assignment, five points. So that should be easy five points towards your quizzes. All right. And uh, if I have any video recording, which I record all the uh, lectures, 
and uh, it usually take about a few hours to um, publish them, but uh, you should expect to see an update within 24 hours. Um, if there's any um, recording available, again, will be on this page, on the pages, and it should be somewhere there. There's a link go to the recording. And the homework, again, you can click on links here. So that should take you to homework one. Um, I have, I probably still have to work on the, the logistics to get it set up because I'm having a little bit of trouble. So the homework usually take you to um, a website called WebAssign. Uh, this is my version, but you should be able to see something similar when you log into this uh, WebAssign through um, Canvas page. All right, so that's the homework. And uh, you can also click on modules which is gonna have all the quizzes, the homework assignments and exams here. So there's multiple ways to access the homework um, or quizzes. But pages is where I will be using the most to upload and uh, to organize my um, recordings or homework and uh, assignments. All right, grades is where you can check your grades. So if you complete an assignment, it should show up right here. Right, you can keep track of your progress throughout the term. Uh, one thing I want to point out, if you have never used um, my courses or sometimes called Canvas before, so you should click on the account and then click on notifications. Uh, let me leave student view. So if you go to notifications, you probably will be able to set the notification for the due dates, um, when there's a new file uploaded or when there's an assignment created. So you get an email notification basically all the time. It's, um, you can choose different notification for each one of them. Just go through them so that you don't miss anything through email. Let's see. Uh, that was Canvas page. Um, do you have any questions about this website? Awesome. All right, if you do, please let me know. Feel free to raise your hand or just unmute yourself. All right, so let me go back to the syllabus. Let's go through it quickly. I know that this is like a typical right first lesson. We go through the syllabus and then we can talk a little bit about the material. So lectures will be Monday, Wednesday, Thursdays from 6.10 to 8.30 through, through Zoom. And a Zoom link will be available on the website. Uh, if you click on my welcome announcements, I'll just click on the syllabus. The Zoom link is right in the middle of the second page. Right. And the office hours are currently, oops, are currently Monday, uh, Thursday, Friday through Zoom. I might have to change it, but uh, if you, for some reason, need some help and uh, now of the time works, feel free to email me in advance. We can set up a time. And this is my email. You can email me here through this email. Um, you can also write a message to me through Canvas page of my courses. Uh, but it's preferred that you email me directly. Right, like I said, the textbook is free and it's online. If you click on the link in the syllabus, it should take you directly to the textbook. Oops, that's not what I wanted. All right, so this is the textbook we're gonna use. We're gonna go through quite a few chapters in this book. Um, so you can click on each section on the left and it should open the correct section and, uh, and then you just go through this. And the homework problems will be from the textbook as well, but it's gonna be um, assigned through, um, through WebAssign. So that way you, you put your answer in WebAssign, the problems are already there, you don't need to come back to the textbook if you don't wanna use the textbook when you do your homework. So that's where the homework and the textbook is. All right, and it's free. You don't have to pay anything. I'm, I'm certain of that. Um, all right, so class description is right here, um, and I'm pretty sure that there's no need to go through all them. We're just going to talk about a lot about a lot. We're going to talk a lot about functions, different type of functions. Um, at the end, we're going to probably end with um, trick functions, and what's called sinusoidal functions. And the, the learning objectives, I'm going to leave that for you to read. It's just going to take a while if I read it to you. Um, and uh, like I said, the, the meeting link is here. 
a same link for um, office hours. So if you just click on the link, you should be able to join office hours. All right, a couple of things. Uh, I'm gonna try to go through this quickly. So when you join the class, just make sure that your microphone is muted. Um, if you have any questions or comments, feel free to unmute your mic at any time or raise your hand. Just put it in the chat box, it's fine as well. Um, it's re recommended that you keep your webcam, the camera on all the time. But if for whatever reason, you know, you just feel like you just don't want to do it, but make sure you have a Zoom profile picture of yourself uh, that's showing up because I don't want to, I don't want to talk to a whole bunch of names, right? If you use Zoom before, you know, if you don't have a profile picture or if you don't have your camera on, it just your name shows up and uh, it's not interesting to talk to a whole bunch of names. All right, attendance is required. If you cannot attend the lecture, it's important that you communicate with me uh, at least 24 hours in advance. All lectures will be recorded and they will be posted on the website, um, but it might take like 24 hours, but sometimes it might take 48 hours, depends. But I'll try to get the recording available um, as soon as possible after each lecture. All right, assignments and the assessments. So there will be weekly homework available through WebAssign. And uh, my job it will be for tonight and tomorrow will be set up the website, make sure you can um, access your first homework assignment. It says each assignment is about 20 points, which is not true. It depends on how many questions I assign. Each question is one point. Uh, some weeks, there are probably like more questions. Other weeks, there'll be less questions but you will be able to tell whether you answer it correctly or not immediately through web assign. So if you answer it incorrectly, you can go back and correct your work and uh, try to get the perfect score there. So homework really is a, it's a way for you to, let's see, um, let's see for one quiz, you just didn't do well for some reason. And the homework actually, it's gonna help your grade um, overall because you should get most of the problems correct on the homework. Um, because you can try it many times, all right? So one thing to note is the final homework will be due Friday, August 26th at 8 p.m., which is the last day of the summer term. So that's the due date for the last homework assignment. Um, let's see. All right, so I'm gonna leave the next section for you to read when you have time. and. One thing with the web assign is that sometimes when you enter the answer, it's very specific. For example, if the answer you got is 6.2, but the that's an estimate answer, right? But the web sign probably thinks the correct answer is 6.3 if everything is run it correctly. So if you get 6.2, it might give you a wrong, give you an error message telling you that you did it incorrectly. So in that case, just go back, check your work, make sure you estimate all the numbers correctly in the process. Um, usually, if you put in a fraction, it should be okay. Uh, if Unless it says you have to put in the decimal, digit, decimal form, but uh, generally speaking, fractions are much more acceptable answer than decimals. All right, so there'll be four quizzes and the quiz dates are given. Uh, quizzes are given in the middle of lectures. So on those days that we have lectures, make sure you are present because if you miss a lecture for whatever reason and then you don't tell me about it or you don't get my uh, permission to miss that class, then you're not gonna get any chance to retake the quizzes. That's just something to keep in mind. Uh, like I said, there'll be a five minute mini quiz on Thursday, which just for you to find an app. Um, make sure you download the app before class and then scan five pages of notebook or textbook, whatever you use, five pages. The reason I don't want to accept pictures because pictures usually make it difficult to grade on my end. So PDF is the only file format that I'm, that I'm gonna accept for all homework, um, not homework, for all quizzes and uh, exams. So make sure that you can you know how to scan five pages into a single PDF file. That's very important. There'll be three midterm exams. I believe they are all on Mondays. Um, double check the dates. Um, let's see. And uh, here's the grading 
So homework is going to be about 30% of your overall grade. And the quiz is about 30%. And the interim exams will be about 40% in total. And the latter grades will be given us the following. I'm not going to read through them. But one thing to note, if you plan on taking um, Math 425, which is Calculus 1, I believe, in the future, like for example, if you want to take it in the fall term, you need to have at least a C. If you have a C minus or D, none of this will be acceptable if you plan on taking Math 425 at UNH. So just keep that in mind. Um, all right. So policy on work. So late, late work will not be accepted. Um, and uh, all work must be submitted as a single PDF file. Pictures and individual pages scans are not accepted. All right, keep that in mind. Um, so all homework problems will be assigned through web assign. Again, after you do the first homework, it should be um, relatively easy to follow the website and the complete homework there. And the quizzes and the exams. Um, for all quizzes and exams, obviously, we're just going to take it over Zoom, right? You have to be honest with yourself. You cannot use your book, your textbook, notes. You cannot look problems up on the internet. Um, and, uh, and you cannot copy from someone else, right? So just make sure that you do all the work yourself and submit your, own, your original work. Um, if just think about this is for your own benefit, right? I mean, you could nowadays, you know, there's so many ways to get the solutions. Um, you don't really learn anything from it, right? If you feel like you're not prepared and uh, you try to take the shortcut at the end, it's going to hurt yourself. When you take the next math class, if you do planning on taking one, you're going to feel like you are unprepared. So just be responsible to your own learning. All right, absence policy. Uh, you can make up one quiz or exam if you inform me at least 24 hours in advance. And it has to be reasonable. For example, if you say like, oh, my family is going to go to Cape Cod for the weekend next week, and I'm not going to come back for, I don't know, X amount of days, um, that's not a legit reason. Because if you have to go to the Cape, Cape Cod and you're going to miss a class, that's your choice. I'm not going to excuse you um, for that. Right. But if you have to, for example, something happened that's an emergency, has to go to the hospital, something like that, that's understandable. All right. Just um, use your own judgment there. Or if you have like a personal reason, um, just let me know. Um, usually, I'll, I'll try to be. Um, understandable, but there are situations that we cannot allow it. That's a university policy. So after each quiz or each exam, you're going to have about 10 minutes to scan your work and uh, submit it on the on a Canvas page. So if you don't submit your work within 10 minutes, in that case, it will be considered as a no submission. All right, keep that in mind. I think 10 minutes should be enough to scan five pages using your phone. And uh, the rest is academic dishonesty. So again, just find some time, read it, university notice, disability protocol. Um, if you have accommodations, which is fine, uh, but make sure you contact, contact um, Student Accessibility Service, SAS. Um, and uh, you, I believe they will send me your um, accommodation letter if you have one. If you have accommodation letters from some other places, that's not acceptable. So it has to go through SAS, All right? So make sure you call them or go to their website, contact them one way or another so that I can receive your accommodation letters um, as soon as possible. And COVID, we really don't have to worry about COVID now because it's, we're doing it online. Um, and the code of conduct of, for university respects, that's the rest. All right, I go through it really quickly. I know that you probably have some questions. Um, and uh, I'm gonna stop talking for a couple of minutes. So let you think about this. Raise your hand or unmute yourself if you have any questions about the, the class, the plan, 
follow the syllabus, follow the policy. Any questions? Yeah, I got a question about um, the class. Okay, go ahead. So are most classes going to fill up this two hours and 20 minute block? Or like, is it going to be like a little shorter some days? I, I hope so. I, I don't imagine oh, yeah. sitting here talking for two and a half hours, two, an hour, two hour and 20 minutes. Uh, we're going to have a break. So after about one hour and a half, or maybe one hour, 15 minutes, we're going to have like a 10 minutes break, um, unless you don't want to so if everyone don't want a break that's fine we can just keep going but uh i think it's probably better just get up and uh, stretch legs for a few, at least five minutes um in the middle of this um session all right, all right. good question thank you uh yep like i said you know i totally understand this is like a dinner time for a lot of a lot of us right um i actually like I actually had to eat quickly before I came here. But uh, it, like I said, I totally understand if you need to eat, but just make sure you have a profile picture on the Zoom. That way I'm talking to your faces, right? Not to your names. So that's something that you can um, you can do. Um, let's see. All right, so will work be acceptable reason if the scheduling cannot be changed? Um, if you have, okay, right. Um, if you have work, uh, which sure, I understand, right? Some of you have uh, have to work in the summer, so do I. Um, in that case, it's fine if you have to miss, let's say like one exam, right? Or one quiz on a specific day. But uh, if um, if your work always get in the way of your, of you taking this class, I think that's something that you should talk to your workplace, see if there's any arrangements that you can make with them. All right, I hope that answers your question, Tim. Um, and uh, in that case, you should uh, contact me, say like, oh, I have work on this day, and we have an exam on this day. The, the boss just don't let me reschedule it. Then you can um, talk to me. We can go through, uh, go figure out a plan for your the exam. All right, good question. All right, any other questions? All right, how many of you have never used Zoom before? Raise your hand if you never used Zoom for a class in the past, which is almost impossible, right? Um, given that what we just went through for what, two years, three years, two and a half years. Um, all right, awesome. It looks like, okay, so I'm not gonna spend time explaining Zoom and how to use it. So do you all know how it works, right? Either use the chat box, unmute yourself, raise your hand, whatever you need, just um, make yourself comfortable on the Zoom. All right, so in that case, um, I think I'm gonna stop talking about the syllabus. I think we can just um, get started with, today's lesson. All right, let's see. All right, another thing I want to quickly mention is that for me, I use this uh, Microsoft OneNote um, to write, to teach. Even when I'm teaching in person, I also use this to write and uh, just project my screen on the, on the whiteboard. Um, so that's what I will be using the whole time. Um, if for any parts you feel like I'm moving too fast with the lecture, or if you feel like you have trouble following my writing, um, just let me know and I'll try to do a better job. All right, so let's get started uh, with today's lesson. And uh, hopefully it doesn't take too long and I just have to keep track of the time. I'm gonna give you a break around like somewhere between seven and uh, 7.30, uh, let's see. All right, so we're going to begin with talking about functions. So by definition, a function is a relation 
between an input and an output. Now the typical picture that I that I always remember about functions is that if you have something looks like a rectangle and then on this top left corner that something goes in and then the bottom right corner you got something comes out right so that's a very typical picture of functions so what this function it does it takes some input and it spits out some output it could be a value it could be an expression um, with variables so one thing that I want to kind of mention here is the input. So if we take all the possible values that could possibly go into the function, so input is the set of all, oh, sorry, let me erase this. I'm not doing it right. So the input is just something that we can put into the function. I was talking about domain. So domain is the set of all possible input. So that's a key there. So if we take all the input values, put them together, that's what we call a domain. And if you remember that range, it's just the set of values we get from the function. It's a set of outputs. Now, I'm pretty sure that you have seen this before, even if you have taken a algebra class right in the past, you, you probably learned this already. Um, so that's just domain and a range. Think about domain as the input values as all the values that you could possibly throw into the function and a range is something you get. One thing I always think about, this is like a juice machine, right? If you take oranges, you put in there, you got orange juice. If you take apples, you throw in there, you get apple juice. So functions are kind of like this machine that takes something input and then do something to it. That's what the function does. And then it spits out something, something else, right? So that's a domain range and a function. Now, a specific, a more specific definition about a function is that a function maps one input to exactly one output. So if we put one input in there, we can only get one output. We're not gonna end up with two different outputs when we put in an input. For example, uh, if we put orange juice, oranges in there in a juice machine, we're not going to end up with orange juice and apple juice at the same time, right? You can only get orange juice. Um, so that's what a function. So it takes one input and it gives one output, but that one input never gives multiple outputs. So notation wise, we usually write y equals f of x. In this notation, we read, uh, read as y is a function of x. So that's what y equals to f of x. That's how we read it. Y is a function of x. In this case, the y is the output and the x here is the input now even though we say y is the output f of x itself is also so f of x together it's also a output um, it doesn't have to have a y there it just f of x is what we get at the end after we take x as the input so that's just something that don't get confused. So every time you see f of x or f of two or f of a, just think about that's equivalent to y basically. So let me note that. Note f of x is 
equivalent to y because we get used to y equals mx plus b but that's really um, the same if you have f of x equals mx plus b all right so here's a few examples we can use diagrams you've probably all seen this in algebra class So let's see, this is a number, this is the second number, there's a third one in the input part, and then we have this output part. So that's an example of a function because for every input, we can, un we can only go to one output so this middle input, again, it goes to one output. For the last input, it goes to one output. Even though the second and the last inputs, they go to the same output, that doesn't matter. It's still one input goes to one output, right? They don't have to be different outputs. The outputs could be the same as long as one input goes to one output. So that's an example of a function. Now, an example of not a function would be For example, if we take the input matches there, and then we take a second input matches here, but then we also have a second input match to a different output. So the middle part here, that's problematic because this tells us that one input actually goes to two different outputs. So that's not okay. So this is not a function. because one input goes to two different outputs. You could, um, we could still have the last one goes into different output, that's fine. But nevertheless, that's not a function. We can also use tables. For example, we might have, let's see, this is a time, this is a height, let's call it H of T. So a time could be one, two, two, five. Oh, sorry, one, two. Let's see, this is a full five. So that could be height could be, let's say 20 feet high, 30 feet high, and then go back to 20 feet high, and then go back to 30 feet high. That's totally fine because T being the input, every T value one has one height, every, uh, T equals two corresponding to a value, four corresponding to a value, five also corresponding to a value, right? So every T value, it corresponds to, corresponding to one height. A not example, uh, example that's not a function, a kind of example that would be, let's see, T is here, the H of T still there, it might be have one, two, two, five, and then 20, 30, 20, 30. So the problem here is with the input two, t equals two, they actually give us two different heights, 30 and the 20, so that's not okay. Because we want every input only corresponds to one output not two, right? And then we could also have number pairs. So let's say we have a set of points. Let's see, we could have one, two, as a pair of numbers, three, four, five, six. So in each pair of numbers, the first number is always the input. So those are the inputs. And the outputs are the second numbers in each pair of numbers. So if we look at the input one, it has one output. Input three has one output. Input five has one output. So that's a function. But then if we change it, let's see we have one, two, three, four. And then we have 
three, six, that's not okay because the input three corresponding to two different outputs, four and a six. So that's gonna be a problem here, right? So one input should only corresponding to one output. All right, so we could also have graphs For example, if I have this graph, that's a function. Because if I pick an input, a corresponding x value, so this is the x, this is the y, let's see if I pick this x value, it only corresponding to one y value. If I pick a x value to the right here, and it also corresponding to one y value, Right, so that's the function. But a counterexample would be, let's just say um, it looks like this. Right, so this is problematic because if I pick an X value maybe here, and this X value, if I go down a little bit, it corresponding to this Y value. If I go up a little bit, it corresponding to maybe one or two, let's just say one point on the curve, it gave me a second Y value. So it actually gives me two Y values. So Y1, Y2 corresponding to the same X value. So that's not okay, right? So that's one input give us two different outputs. Or maybe if I pick this point here, then that's gonna give me three different Y values. That's also not okay. Um, oh, I want to point out one thing I forget to mention. Um, so my lecture notes, of what I'm writing here, um, I'm going to save it as a PDF at the end of the lecture and I'll put it on the website as well. So if you don't have a habit of taking notes, uh, which is totally fine because you're going to have my notes available. If you enjoy taking notes, feel free to do it. It's up to you. But like I said, I'm going to post this um, lecture notes at the end of the lecture. All right. Okay, so that's a fun that's not a function for the second case. Now, so this will kind of generalize a special technique that to test whether a graph is a function or not. So for a graph to be a function. It must pass what you already remember in the past. It's called vertical line test. What that says is that when we draw a vertical line, it must meet the graph no more than one point in order to pass it. So to pass vertical line, uh, to pass vertical line test, each vertical line can meet the function, the graph at most one point. So that's, if we take uh, any curve we have, right? And then we're gonna draw a vertical line, for example, we have, let's see, um, for example, just a parabola, basically. So if we draw a vertical line, doesn't matter where we draw it, we could be here, it meets the graph at once, it could be here, it meets it once, here, it meets the graph once. Doesn't matter where you draw the vertical line, it only meets the graph at most one point. Now you probably think, okay, what if I draw here and it doesn't touch the graph? That's fine. It doesn't have to touch the graph, um, but it cannot touch the graph more than one point. So that's how we know if a graph is a function. We use this called vertical line test. All right. Um, any questions at this point? I guess I feel free to um, unmute yourself or put it in the chat box. Do you have any questions?
All right, so that's kind of like the introduction with function definition. Uh, let's start using functions. So the next thing we're going to do is we're going to evaluate functions. It means that we can use a given function to find out a value, or output, or maybe some expression for the output, or maybe use a function to do some uh, um, algebraic simplification. Okay, so let's see. Ah, excellent. So an example that will fail a uh, vertical line test. Good. So that will be this one on the right here. So the, the second example, second like graph example. I'll give you another one later. So for example, if I draw a vertical line here and it touch the graph at three points, so that's more than one, so that fails the vertical line test. If I draw it right where I draw the first dotted line on the left, so that's gonna meet the graph at two points that also fails the vertical line test. A common example that's used a lot in classrooms and textbooks is that circles, right? We all know circles, it's a very nice shape, but the circles, the circles, do they represent a function? Well, the answer is actually no, because if we were to draw a vertical line here, it touched the circle at two points, so that's not a function. So not a function. And this one, yes, a function. All right, excellent, good question. Feel free to ask questions. Um, so evaluating functions, here's an example. Given f of x equals x squared minus 3x plus 4. It's a quadratic function. You probably already know it from previous classes. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to find f of 2. How do we find f of 2? Now, the way I remember the f of 2 notation is that anything in the parentheses. So here we have function of something, right? So this is the function of two, means the input is two. Anything inside the parentheses, that's the input. Just like in the given function, we have x in the parentheses. So x is the input. So what we do is we just take this new input two, we replace all the x values, all the x um, parts in the function. So we're gonna take the two, we're gonna put into this given function above. So every time we see an x, just think about x is the parentheses. It's something that you can sort of take it out and put something new in there. So we can replace the x there, so that becomes two squared minus three times two. And the four doesn't have an x, it's just a four. Right, and then the rest is about simplifying. So two squared is four minus three times two is six, and then plus four. And then the rest we can figure out. Um, I'm not gonna do the algebra that it shouldn't be that difficult, but this is something I want you to get comfortable with my teaching is that when it gets to um, simple, like a very, very simple algebra towards the end, I usually don't work out the, the final answer because I feel like it's not necessary, right? As long as we get the process right, we understand where to plug in the two and then we can do a little bit of simplification. At the end, we probably wouldn't make a mistake. All right, so the next thing I want to find is find f of k. Now, just like the two in the previous example, the k here is inside the parentheses, so this is my input. And all I have to do is take this input and I'm gonna put into the original function and I'm gonna replace x. So that's gonna be f, so, that, so that's gonna be f of k, equals, so the x squared becomes k squared minus three times k plus four. And then the rest is simplifying, really not much we can simplify, just except for rewriting it by dropping the parentheses, right? And then the next thing we can do is find f of x plus h. So now we're getting more complicated expressions as input. So, but nevertheless, it's still the input. So x plus h together as the as one expression, as one part, 
is the input. So we're going to take x plus h, and we're going to put into the function to replace all the x's. So that's going to be x squared become x plus h squared, and minus 3x becomes minus 3, the x become x plus h, and the 4 is just a 4. And from here, we can expand it. Um, if you're familiar with x plus h on the side, let me do the work on the side. So x plus h squared is x plus h times x plus h. And here we have to follow you. So that's something to keep in mind. It's not x squared plus h squared. So we have to expand carefully. So that's going to be for you x squared x times h. And then we have another x times h, and then plus h squared. So that's going to give us x squared plus 2xh plus h squared. It's not x squared plus h squared. Keep that in mind. In fact, that's actually a formula that we can use for quadratic expressions like this, which says if we have a plus b squared, that becomes a squared plus 2ab plus b squared. That's what I, what I was taught, and I memorized it, and I found it very helpful. But you do have to have it memorized, it, memorized right? Um, if, what if we have subtraction? What if we have a minus b squared? Well, if we have a minus b squared, it's just going to be minus 2ab. That's it. Nothing else changes. All right. So I recommend you memorizing it if you want. Otherwise, just spoil. Really be careful. Um, so here, the first term becomes x squared plus 2xh plus h squared. But then we have the middle term, right? Minus three times the parentheses. So we can distribute the negative three in there. So we get minus three X under the negative three times H. So minus three H. And what about the plus four? We're just gonna leave it plus four. And the, the next thing is try to combine like terms. Looks like we can't do anything. So let's leave it. Does this make sense? All right. Let me know if you have any questions. So that's finding f of x plus h. Now we can also try to find something more complicated like f of x plus h minus f of x divided by h. It's a complicated expression because it has numerators, has two parts, right? We have a fraction, right? The numerator, we have two parts. Um, I'm gonna be a little bit lazy because I, I already know what f of x plus h is, so I can use it directly from the previous example. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take the expression, we're gonna put into the numerator on the left. So that's gonna be x squared plus 2xh plus h squared minus 3x minus 3h plus four. And then we move on to the second part of the numerator, which is minus f of x. Do we know what f of x is? Yes, we do. So let's put in the f of x, which is, let's go back, f of x equals x squared minus 3x plus 4. So we're going to take that and put into this parentheses. So that's going to be x squared minus 3x plus 4. And then the denominator is divided by h, which we just leave it. Because here, the h doesn't go anywhere in the denominator, just h. In the numerator, we take some expressions, put into the function, then we take another expression, f of x, we're going to put them together through a subtraction. So now we just have to simplify the numerator, maybe with the denominator. Let's see. So the numerator we have, let's drop the parentheses. We get x squared plus 2xh plus h squared minus 3x minus 3h plus 4. Then we have minus x squared plus 3x minus 4 if we distribute the negative carefully. And uh, always simplify anything that you can simplify. For example, I have x squared minus x squared, that's a 0, minus 3x, positive 3x, that's a 0, 
plus four minus four again at the zero. So we end up with two X H plus H squared minus three H divided by H. Now we need to simplify. It's not correct to take one of the H in the numerator and cross it with a denominator H. So what I meant is that some people like to say, oh, that's the H, that's the H, cancel it. That's not correct. If you want to cancel something from the numerator with the denominator, you have to make sure that it's a factor from the numerator or the denominator. It means you can factor it up first and then cancel. So what we need to do here is we need to factor first before we cancel anything with the denominator. So that will be, let's take our H from here, from there, and from here. So we get, let me highlight it. So we want to factor our h there. So I highlight the h square because it has the h. Um, so let's factor our h. So that becomes h times parentheses 2x plus h minus 3 and divide by h. So now it's okay to cross out the h because in the numerator it's h times everything else. In the denominator it's h times 1. That's when you can actually cross them out. In the end, we just end up with 2x plus h minus 3. Do you have any questions about what I did over here, over this um, problem? I know it looks long. Uh, trust me, at some point um, when you take calculus, that might be like a one week or two weeks. You're going to have to do this all the time. Um, that's just a very important expression that you need to get comfortable with in calculus. So this expression I wrote here is called difference quotient because it's a difference in the quotient. So it's called difference quotient formula or expression. It's very easy to remember. Just think about the difference. It's a subtraction in the numerator and then that with the denominator H forms a quotient. Now, why do we talk about this, right? Just give you a little bit taste of calculus. In calculus, you probably heard about the term derivative. So the derivative of a function is equal to limit, which we're probably gonna talk about later if you haven't seen it before. H goes to zero of this difference quotient formula. So that's why we need to get comfortable with this different difference quotient formula. Don't have to memorize it because when you take calculus, you're gonna see this over and over. You're not gonna even forget it by the end of this calculus term. All right, so that's evaluating functions. The next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna take the same function. So recall the function we had is x squared minus 3x plus 4. That's what we had earlier. We're going to solve the equation f of x equals 4, for example. So how do we solve it? What does it mean to solve f of x equals 4? Well, remember that f of x is like y. So we know the output is equal to 4. We just need to find the input. So that means to solve means to find input x value. So what we're gonna do is we're just gonna take the function and we're gonna set it equals four. So we had the function to be x squared minus three x plus four. That's what's given. That's a function of x. We're gonna set that equals four and then we're gonna look for x. So from here, what we can do is we can subtract four on both sides we get x squared minus 3x equals zero. And how do we solve this? Well, you can either use quadratic formula or you can try to factor. Uh, turns out that this example is a bit easy to factor. So that will be taking our x first on the left. So we get x remaining from x squared minus three, and that's equal to zero. Now, if you remember that, if you have multiple parts together, when they multiply together, give you a zero. 
this is called a zero product prob uh, property. So that means the x could be zero. The x minus three could also be zero, which give us two x values, x equals zero, x equals three. So that's what it means to solve the equation f of x equals four. All right, let's me pause for a minute and uh, see if there's any questions. Okay, um, the next thing what we're gonna do is we're gonna use tables. So tables, from tables, we can also evaluate functions or solve equations. So suppose we have a table, t, h of t, with value one, two, three, and the, those are the times, and the height is, let's see, uh, 20, 18, two. And with a table, what we can do is we can find Let's see, h of three. What this means is that, again, we, we have a table with some time and some height, depending on the time, right? That's a function because every time corresponding to one height. And uh, what we want to find h of three says, the three is the input. So when the input time, in this case, equals three, what is the height? So what we do is we just go to the table, and then we're looking for time equals three, which is here. So if time equals three, what is the height equals two? So that's how we end up with um, h of three by looking at the table. Now, what about solving equation like solving h of t equals 18, for example? Well, what that says is that we already know h of t equals 18, means that in the h of t row, we're gonna look for 18 and then we're gonna to try to find the input. So if we go to the table, h of t equals 18 corresponding to this part, and then we're gonna look for the input, which is gonna be two. So, T equals two, right? So that's using the table, just like we're using functions where we can directly plug in values into the function. But here we cannot, we have to use the table to, cut, to find the either the input or the output. Now we can do the same thing with graphs. <laughs> so let's say we have a graph. Uh, let's see, if I draw it correctly, let's see, this is a one in the y direction, two, one, two, three, four, and then we have one, two, three, four. And then we can do the same thing by finding, for example, this is a, let's call this h of x graph. So find h of three. Well, how do we find it? What we do is we're gonna to go to the input three, right? Input three is here, and we're just gonna to go towards the graph and try to figure out what the Y is. So in this case, I'm gonna estimate, looks like the Y value is about 2.5. So H of three equals 2.5. Kind of like the table, right? We, we go to the corresponding T value and then we find the height, but in this case, we go to the corresponding x-axis and then go up to the graph to find the corresponding y. Now, there might be another question that solve h of two. Oh, sorry, uh, no, h of x equals two. Well, we're looking for x values, but we know that the y value, the output has to, is two, Okay, so let's go to the, the graph. So let's look at this 
output that's two, so which is here. So let's, from there, we're gonna go to the curve. And it looks like it's gonna give me this corresponding X value. Let's see, I just run it that to maybe 2.7 or 2.6, doesn't matter. Because it's a little bit more than two, it's not, not quite three yet. That's one value. But we could also go left. It doesn't have to go right. We can go left and then finding the corresponding value. I didn't label the x axis. Hold on. So that's the negative one, negative two, negative three. So if I try to draw a symmetric shape, so we probably end up with a negative 2.7. But if I didn't want it to be symmetric, then I'm probably end up with a negative two point some number that's not quite the same as 2.7. I see that's negative 2.1. So now we have two X values corresponding to the same Y value, which is perfectly fine. We just, we cannot have two Y values corresponding to the same X value. That's something to keep in mind. All right. Um, any questions about what I said so far? All right, let's see. I'm just looking at my notes to see what's coming up next. Um, all right. Okay. All right, the next thing I have is rewriting equations. So for example, if I'm given uh, x equals eight, uh, sorry, x minus, so let's, let's restart this. So rewrite functions. If I'm given an equation, x minus eight y cubed equals zero. So the question could be express x in terms of y or you could say express y as a function of x All right two things that the could possibly ask us to do to rewrite the rewrite the given um, equation. So if we want to express x in terms of y, we can just move the y term to the right side and leave the x. We get x equals 8y cubed. So x is a function of y. In this case, we can write x of y equals 8y cubed because x depends on y. y is the independent variable, the input. Right. Now, they could also be writing, is re expressing y in terms of x. So that could be, we need to solve for y. So we begin with this one, x minus 8y cubed equals 0. We want to solve for y and express it as a function of x. So we're going to move x to the other side. So we got y, a negative 8y cubed equals negative x. And then we're going to divide by negative 8. So y cubed equals negative x over negative 8. So the negative negative cancel become positive. And then we take cube root. So y equals cube root of x over 8. If we simplify this, that becomes cube root of x divided by cube root of 8. And then the denominator becomes the 2 because 2 cubed is 8. The numerator, not much we can do. So now we have y as a function of x. And the, to write it appropriately, so we can say y of x, or just y, is equal to cube root x over 2. But we don't really, often we just say y. We don't write y of x, right? We just, we already know y depend on x. But notation y, that's correct. That's um, another way to write it. So that's a rewriting function. So whichever you want to keep, and you just keep, try to isolate it as much as possible, and then that will be your function. Um, anything that you don't want to keep, just move it to the other side and uh, 
follow the um, operations. All right, I'm gonna do one more thing before I let, I'm gonna give you a break. Um, it's just that there's quite a bit of information in the introduction here. All right, so the next thing I want to talk about is a one, two, one function. So it's a specific type of functions. So one, two, one function is a function uh, that each output has exactly one input. So we talk about being a function says, so if something is a function, a graph is a function, a table is a function, if every input has exactly one output, right? So that's a function. But a one-to-one -one function, it's a specific type of functions, which says, every output has to have exactly one input. You cannot have one output matching with two inputs. So an example we had earlier, for example, something like this. This is still a function. So this is a function. It's a function but it's not one-to-one. -one. It's not one-to-one -one because the output, if we look backwards, because this output here, it corresponding to two inputs. So that makes it not a one-to-one -one function, but it's still a function. Now, how do we fix it? How do we make it one-to-one? -one? So here's the example. Let's see, we still have those two inputs. The first input goes there, the second input maybe goes here. So now it's one to one. It's still a function, it's also one to one. So for a one to one function, you must have one output corresponding to exactly one input. You cannot have two inputs goes to the same output. And a graphically, so if I write something like this, so every Y value we have, it has only one X value. Doesn't matter where we pick the Y, if we pick the Y here, it only has one X value. That's a one to one. But if I give you a different example, let's see um, a example like we saw earlier, a parabola. So let's see, we take this as a Y value and this Y value could correspond to this X value. This y value could also correspond to this x value. It's still a function because it passed vertical line test, right? But it's not one to one because it has two x values corresponding to the same y value. So recall vertical line test tells whether uh, if a graph is a function, right? So that's a vertical line test. Now we're gonna use something called horizontal line test differently from what you seen before. So horizontal line test, tells if a function is one to one. So 
So let me rewrite that. Let me move this part out of the way to kind of line up the second half of the sentence correctly. So one thing to keep in mind that vertical line tells whether something is a function or not. So that's deciding whether it's a function, right? And the horizontal line tells whether it's one to whether the function, we already know it's a function, but we want to know if it's a specific type one-to-one -one function. So that's what we use horizontal line test. Now you've probably seen horizontal line test in the past to determine if a function has an inverse or not. Um, that's a different way of using the horizontal line test. It's not the same thing here. We'll talk about different things. All right, so here's the example. Um, well, a couple examples. Is this a function? And is it is it one to one? Well, if we want to know whether it's a function or not, we're just going to draw vertical lines if it passes vertical line test. Right, so if we do a vertical line here, or if we draw a vertical line here, it doesn't matter. They always pass vertical line test. So yes, it's a function. And if I want to know whether, oh, let me leave those vertical lines. If I want to know whether it's a um, one to one, I'm gonna draw a horizontal line. So I can draw it here. Okay, it looks like it passed the line at one point. Uh, but if I draw it here, then it passed the graph at three points. So that's not okay because just like a vertical line test, horizontal line test says we can only meet the graph at once, at most one point. So only touch the graph at most once. Right, so the blue line I draw touched the graph at three points at some point, so it's not one to one. All right, how are you guys doing? Doing okay? Awesome. All right, so let's take a quick, um, let's see, five minute break. I'll see you um, back here about 7.28 or 7.30 ish. All right, see you back here at 7.30. All right, go take a break. record the, I forgot to record the video for the last 20 minutes. Oh, well, I have my lecture notes. Um, so that's the square root of X, but I'm only keeping the function from full to the right. So I'm not keeping anything on the left and I'm not including full. So that will be from four to the right. So starting this point on the square root of X and I go all the way to the right, not including full. And anything on the left, I'm going to erase it because I don't need that part. So that will be the last piece. So that's a piecewise function. All right. So that's how we graph piecewise functions. Let me just quickly go back, see if I miss anything. Domain range, yeah. Okay. All right. Um, so
So the next thing we're going to talk about is just linear functions. It's a quick review. If I'm pretty sure that you all seen it before. Um, I'm going to try to go through it a little bit quicker here. That way we can finish it in time. Um, so linear functions. So that's a few forms. For linear functions, linear functions basically means the graph is the line, um, and uh, the the y value, the output depends linearly on the input. Um, the slope-intercept form you all remember. Which is y equals mx plus b. Now, if we use function notation, that's going to be f of x. The function of x is mx plus b the equivalent. And then the other form is called point slope form. Sorry, not point, yeah, point slope. Which it says y, so if we know the slope is m and a given point, Let's say the given point is x1, y1, and then the equation for the line will be y minus y1 equals the slope times x minus x1. So that's the point slope form. To be honest, I rarely use point slope form. When I, if I, if that's a problem, you know, I need to find the linear equation, I just use y equals mx plus b. It doesn't really make much difference. And then there's the standard form, which says ax plus by equals c. And the, we don't really use standard form that much uh, neither. So mostly the slope intercept form means if you have the slope intercept form, Let's see, y equals mx plus b. I just want to point out a couple of things you probably know or you probably don't know in the past. So the y obviously is the output. And the x is the input, is the independent variable. The m is the slope. But often in calculus or pre-calculus, pre classes, you hear the term rate of change. So what this says is basically telling us for every one unit increase in x, so if x increased by one, how much does y change? So that's the rate of change, the slope. And the b here, which is the y-intercept, but often we think about B in practical problems as the initial value or the starting value or fixed cost in some problems. Fixed cost. So every problem you see, it says, oh, the, the initial value uh, is this, and then it goes up by 300 every day, and then that initial value will be the B, the Y in the set. And if it says it goes goes up 300 a day, then the that's the rate of change. For each day, it goes up 300, right? So that's just some um, something to keep in mind when you think about linear functions. And uh, I just want to quickly remind you about the slope formula. M is equal to rise over run, which is changing Y divided by changing X. Normally we write Y2 minus Y1 divided by X2 minus X1, but it's totally okay if you say, oh, I'm gonna write Y1 minus Y2 divided by X1 minus X2, it's totally fine. Nothing wrong there. Now in a function notation, Y2 is corresponding to F of X1, sorry, F of X2, it's the, y value when x equals x2, that's a y2, minus f of x1 divided by x2 minus x1. So that's just a function notation, literally means the same thing as y2 minus y1. 
Let's practice one example. So let's say find the equation of a line goes through two points. Let's say the two points are, the first point is zero comma negative two, and then the second point is five comma one. We want to, we have here we have two points. Let's just say somewhere we have the first point is zero negative two, the second point is five one, and we want to know the equation of this line goes through the two points, right? So problem like this, what do you do first? The first thing you want to do is to find the slope if it's not given. So find slope first. If we have two points, we can just use the right over wrong or changing y divided by changing x. So that will be slope equals, I'm gonna take the second point as the y, uh, x2, y2. So that's gonna be one minus negative two divided by five minus zero. And if we do it correctly, one minus negative two is one plus two, so that's a three. Divide by five minus zero is five, so that's a slope. And then what we can do is we can either write down the slope intercept form or point slope form is what we know. So that's gonna be, uh, it's easier to use the point slope form, but I'm not gonna use that. I'm just gonna use the slope intercept form, which is y equals m, the slope three over five, x plus b. We still don't know the y intercept here. But if you kind of notice here, the first point I gave you, zero comma negative two, that actually tell you the y intercept negative two, because it tell you x equals zero, y equals negative two. So we can use the negative two directly, b equals negative two. If you don't see that, no problem. Just take one point, put in there to replace x and a y. What I meant by that is if we don't see the y-intercept directly, we could just say, okay, I'm gonna take one of the point, the first point, I'm gonna plug in the x value, plug in the y value, I get negative two equals two over three times zero plus b. Plugging x equals zero, plugging y equals negative two, that's what I get. And then I can solve for b equals negative two. And to take the, take the B value, put it into the equation, I got Y equals three over five X minus two. So that's the slope into that form of the line goes through those two points. If you were solving a problem on a quiz or homework, if you say, okay, I really want to use the point slope form, don't worry, that's totally fine. All right, um, any questions? Okay, the next thing I want to talk about, am I moving too fast? Uh, raise your hand if you feel like I'm going too fast that you need more time to catch up. Uh, let me know. Okay, all right, um, okay, no problem. And uh, I'm gonna just pause for like a minute or two. Take your time to um, catch up. All right, the next thing I want to do is practice, um, is to practice graphing um, linear functions. For example, if we are given, let's see y equals two over three x minus four. 
right? How do we graph it? That's a few ways you can do. One is um, using the slope and the y-intercept because this is already in the slope intercept form. So this is the slope. This is the y-intercept. Now, when we identify the y-intercept and slope, we have to keep the negative sign with the number. So slope equals two over three means that we're gonna go, so slope equals two over three means we're gonna go two units up because it's positive and the three units to the right because it's positive. If it's negative, we're gonna go left, all done. And the y-intercept is equal to negative four. So that's gonna tell us a point on the y-axis which is negative four. Let's just see this is negative four, negative two, zero, positive two, positive four. And then this is, um, let's see, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three. Um, so if we use the slope intercept, so we first plot the y-intercept, at negative four on the y-axis. And then we're just gonna use a slope to go up and go right. It says going up two units, so go to negative two, that's two units up. And then we're gonna go right three. So one, two, three goes all the way there. So that's three units to the right. So that gave me a second point. And then you know when we graph lines, two points is enough. So what we do is we, we're gonna draw a line through those two points. So that's the line using the slope intercept. Now, for me, when I graph lines, I personally like to use x intercept and the y intercept instead of using slope and the y intercept. It depends, but usually I think it's easier to use x, y intercept. So the way to, uh, to use the x, y intercepts is that we had to find the x intercept first and then find the y intercept. To find the x intercept, what we're gonna do is we're just gonna set y equals zero because we're finding an x value, we want the other one to go away. So set y equals zero. If we do that, I got zero equals two over three x minus four. Move the four or the two over three x to the left side, so move the four to the left side, I get four equals two over three x. And the x equals, if we multiply by three and divide by two, so I get three times four equals two x divided by two, x equals three times four is 12 divided by two, x equals six. So that's the x intercept. And then I'm gonna find the y intercept which is a little bit easy in this case. We already know that the equation tell us y intercept negative four, but we can also set x equals zero to find the y intercept. So the x term will be gone, so you get y equals negative four. And then if I want to graph it, I just need to graph two points, one on the axis, one on the y axis. So I'm just gonna do say this is the negative two, negative four. And then the x intercept is six. I'm just gonna say this is the one, two, three, four, five, six. So that's six. This is a negative four. And then I, I can just draw it correctly. This method works really well if the slope is not nice. For example, if the slope is let's say um, five seventeenths or whatever, right? Something not nice. You could just say, okay, I'm gonna pick this X value to be the X intercept. I'm gonna pick this to be the Y intercept when you draw lines through them. That's a very quick way to kind of graph it. You don't really have to worry about the scale on the X axis to be correct or on the Y axis to be correct. It doesn't matter. Any way you draw it is correct. What I meant by that is, if I just being lazy say, okay, this is a negative four on the y-axis, this is a positive six on the x-axis, I'm gonna draw a line through them. 
no one can say that's not right. It's correct. Right? Don't have to worry about the scale. So that's graphing linear functions. All right, we are almost down here. There's a few things we have to talk about. Uh, horizontal and the vertical lines, parallel lines and the perpendicular lines. I think we can finish after those. Hopefully that will allow us to finish a little bit early. Okay. All right, so let's talk about, well, let's take a minute. Let's just wait for everyone to finish writing and then we can talk about um, horizontal and vertical lines. So horizontal, and vertical lines. So horizontal lines is basically just a line that's horizontal like the name suggests. So that's a horizontal line. Now, what is the equation for this horizontal line? Well, because the horizontal line doesn't go through any X values on the X axis, it only goes through the Y, one Y value on the Y axis. So let's see, this is the Y equals um, A, for example. Because they only go through this Y, this point on the Y axis, we're just going to say the equation is y equals to a. So that's the equation. Or oh, f of x equals a. That's another way to see it. Because it has a y, the, the line goes through this point, has a y value a on the y axis. So y equals a is the equation. And the vertical lines. Let's just say this is the vertical line. Let me use a different color. This vertical line goes through a point on the x-axis. It must have an x value. Say this is x equals b, right? Then the equation it would be for the line would be just x equals b. The y value could be any number because the line doesn't even touch the y-axis. Means it could be any point um, on that vertical line, any y value. But the x value is fixed to this specific number, b, so x equals b. Now, what about the slope? For horizontal line, the slope is equal to zero because the y doesn't change, doesn't matter where you pick, the difference in y is always gonna be zero because we're not moving up and down. And then the x, the difference in x will be different. So you get zero divided by so what I meant by that is y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. y2 minus y1 is always zero. And x2 minus x1 is just gonna be delta x changing x. So zero divided by anything is zero. For vertical lines, the slope, again, we can follow the same formula. y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1, if we think about the y2 minus y1 is just going to be delta y, but x2 minus x1, because the x value doesn't change on the vertical line, so that's going to be zero. If you remember, if we take anything divided by zero, that's undefined. All right, so, so the slope here for vertical line is undefined. And I want to quickly talk about linear functions briefly about that slope. So if we have a linear function goes like this, going up from left to right, this is a slope is positive case. And if we have a linear function that from left to right, we always read the function from left to right. If it decreases, the slope is negative, so the function decreases. So f of x decreases. 
from left to right, slope is positive, f of x increases from left to right. And then the next thing are parallel lines. So if we have two lines that are parallel, well, they have the same steepness, right? It means the slope are the same. The same slopes. But if we have perpendicular lines, one going up like this and the other one is perpendicular to it, then the slopes are negative. So slopes are negative reciprocals. So it's negative and it's reciprocals. For example, if one slope is, let's say the slope of the first line at one is M1 equals two over five, then the slope of the second, the perpendicular line L2 has the slope, which is you find the negative of the given value. So you multiply by negative one, so it's negative, but then you have to find the reciprocal of two over five, which is five over two. So that's two parts. One is flip the sign, the other one is flip the fraction. Are there any questions about those lines? Oh, okay, awesome. Uh, let's do a couple examples, then that will be the end of it. I'm gonna to try to finish it before 8.30. Um, so examples, so given two lines, y equals two x minus one and 2x minus 4y equals 5. The question is, are uh, these lines parallel, maybe perpendicular, or neither parallel or perpendicular? Well, how do we find out, right, whether they are parallel, perpendicular, or neither? Well, what we do is that we look at the slopes, right? Parallel lines have same slopes. Perpendicular lines, the slopes are of uh, negative reciprocals. So let's find the slopes. Let's call this line one. This is a line two. So line one, we already know the slope based on this formula, which is two. So let's say M1, that's a slope for line one. So line one has slope M1 equals two. And the line two here, we don't have a slope yet, but we can solve for it. All we have to do is we're going to take it and then rewrite it in terms of uh, y as a function of x. So we get 2x minus 4y equals 5. So what we're going to do is we're going to solve for y by isolating the y from the equation. So we're going to move 2x to the right side. So we get negative 4y equals if we subtract 2x, so when I move over, become a negative. So negative 2x plus 5. And then I'm going to divide by negative 4. So I got y equals negative 2x plus 5 divided by negative 4, which is the same thing as every term divided by negative 4. So that becomes negative 2x divided by negative 4 plus 5 divided by negative 4. And uh, you know that negative 2x divided by negative 4, that's going to be positive 1 half x, or x over 2, and a plus 5 or minus 5 over 4. So this tells us the second slope is 1 half. So m2 is equal to 1 half. Now, if we compare 2 with 1 half, they're reciprocal, but they're not negative. So this is not 
negative reciprocal. of m1 equals 2. So it's not parallel because they're not the same. It's not negative reciprocal. Therefore, they're not perpendicular. So it's neither. Parallel or no perpendicular. So really coming down to comparing slopes. All right, so last example I have here is a little bit long. It really is two examples combined. The example I have is given a line, y equals negative 2x minus 1. So the first part is find equation of a different line of a line that is parallel to the given line and passes through this point one comma five. So here we have a line. We can graph it or we just need to know that exists a line. Y equals negative 2x minus 1, right? And then I want to find equation of a different line that's parallel to this one, but it goes through the point 1 comma 5. That's all I know. I know that this is some, there's a point somewhere, not on this given line, it's somewhere, the so 1 comma um, Let's see, I probably should draw it a little bit below, it doesn't matter. Uh, so let's see, 1 comma 5, 1 comma 5 is this point, right? So this point is a 1 comma 5. I want a line that's parallel to the given one and it goes through this point. So this is the line that I'm looking for. What is the equation? Right? To find the equation of that line, well, we're going to have to use the fact that those two lines are parallel. Therefore, we need to know the slope. Well, from the given line, we know the slope. So slope of given line is negative 2. Therefore, slope of the line that I'm looking for it's also negative two because they're parallel, so they must have the same slope. So slope of new line, so this is a new one, is negative two. Well, if we know the slope is negative two, and then we know that the point one comma five is on this new line, so no, a point one comma five is on the line. So if we know the slope and we know a point on the line, therefore we can find the equation by using the slope intercept form or the point slope form, whichever is easy. So if I use the, the longer way, the slope intercept form, so I'm gonna say y equals mx plus b, and I already know the slope is negative two. So y equals negative two x plus b, right? And then how do we find the y-intercept? Well, we have a point we haven't used, which is one comma five, which means x equals one, y equals five. So now I can put the point into this equation. So y equals five, x equals one. So five equals negative two times one, plus b, and from here we can solve for b, so five equals negative two plus b, so adding two to both sides, so you get seven equals b.
And then now we're just going to put it back into the equation to equal seven. So we got y equals negative two x plus seven. Does that make sense? Awesome. So, so for that part, we just we just use the fact that parallel lines have the same slope to first find the slope, and then we just use the point given. You point and as a slope we find to find the equation. Now, let's change the question slightly. So the second part, same given line, let's find equation of a line that is perpendicular to the given line. and passes through the same point one comma five so we still have the same setup everything is the same so for now we still have this let me just redraw the line so we have this line goes to like this y equals negative two x minus one and then we have this point one comma five but this time what we're looking for is a perpendicular line to the given line. So it looks like this, perpendicular to it. But then it go, that perpendicular line is gonna go through the point one comma five. How do we solve this? Well, same idea. First of all, we need a slope. So find slope. Well, because of the given line has a slope negative two, so that means slope of the perpendicular line. So slope is negative reciprocal of negative two. So if we take negative two, find the negative reciprocal. So the negative negative become positive. So that's a two, but it's not two. It's a reciprocal of two. So that's a one over two. So that's a slope, the new slope one half. And then we're gonna use the point one comma five, do the same trick. So y equals mx plus b. So y equals one half x plus b. And then use the point one comma five. So five equals one half times one plus b. And then subtract one half. So minus five minus one half equals b. If you know it, uh, b is equal to four and a half or nine over four. Two. Put it back into the equation. So y equals one half x plus nine over two. So I just want to use this to show you that whether we know the line is parallel or perpendicular to the given equation or given line, it doesn't matter. It's just we just use the fact to find the slope. All right, that's all the examples I have. Like I said, I'll finish early. I'm so sorry, I finished so late. It's pretty close to 8:30. Still early though. Um, so I'll see you tomorrow. And uh, like I said, download an app on the phone that can scan some pages that I give you some suggestions that are pretty easy to use if you never use them before. Um, and also, if you're not planning on turning your camera on tomorrow, uh, make sure you have a profile picture um, set up on Zoom. All right, on that note, let's see if there's a question. All right, no problem, Luke. All right, take care, everyone. I'll see you tomorrow around 6.10. All right, take care. Bye-bye.